Welcome. At Memorial, we want to do two things. Learn to know and follow Christ and invite others to do the same. What we mean by that is we want everyone to become all that God intends for them to become and not settle for anything less. Our hope is that everyone feels that our church is a place where you can come and belong. Welcome to the worship service this morning. We are so glad you're here, and may God receive all the glory as we worship together. I, too, want to uh, wish you all a happy Mother's Day. Uh, this is a day to celebrate, uh, to remember, and to honor our moms. And each year, uh, during the first portion of our Mother's Day Sunday, uh, we are sure to honor uh, our moms, and, uh, but the message isn't always a dedicated one because the, the book that we are studying doesn't always apply. Uh, but this year is one of those exceptions uh, where we find at the end of Romans a dedicated chapter to uh, the ministry partners of Paul in Rome. Uh, so yes, we are skipping ahead. Those of, you, those of you that Bible journal give me a hard time about this, but we will come back, don't worry, uh, to the middle of Romans, but we're going to skip ahead to the end. And uh, Paul, who began his ministry career working, uh, we would say, with the wrong company of people. Uh, he was against Christianity. Uh, he supported persecution of Jesus, Jesus's followers. And now, though, look how far he has come. He has a whole host of friends uh, that he ministers along with uh, for Jesus Christ. It's what a changed life simply by him meeting Jesus. So within the final chapter of Romans, and we'll get there in a minute, there were 26 friends of Paul uh, that were honored and greeted by Paul. And some of you are like, I don't know if I could even list 26 friends, but that's okay. Uh, but our focus today will be on the 10 women uh, that are honored by Paul for their ministry for the gospel. And I thought it was appropriate for us to fast forward in the book of Romans and during Mother's Day that we honor the women that are in our congregation uh, who are mothers and also to honor all women in ministry uh, by honoring these 10 women as Paul did. Uh, now, for the young men and the men that are in the audience today or, or listening online, no, it is not time for you to take a nap. <laughs> and here's why. A couple reasons. First, it is time for all of us men to honor the women of our church, and where we, after studying this passage together, can find ourselves very thankful for the strength and the godliness and the character of the women of Memorial Baptist Church. Also, secondly, in this study, men, you will find applicable characteristics that you want to apply to your own life uh, that may be even lacking in your life that you want to work on. And now for the women here, um, and for might these women of Romans encourage you and challenge you and to allow you to grow in your godly character of the women and the ministry of the church in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So these biographies of women, and some of them are very short and some of them are a little more lengthy, um, these biographies of women in ministry that have gone before you uh, with characteristics that are commended by the Apostle Paul is certainly worth a look and certainly worth our time of study this morning. So we will begin with the example of a woman who was a servant of the church and a helper to others. So turn with me to, if you haven't already, to Romans chapter 16. And we will be reading verses 1 and 2 to begin our time. Verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church of Sincentary, that you may welcome her and the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. So essentially, we're going to get an inside look at the friendships of Paul and his friends of ministry uh, all over the known world that were associated, though, with the Roman church in some way. And our 
first friend is the woman that is commended by Paul, and her name is Phoebe. And Phoebe served in the church at Sencrea, which was a seaport off the coast of Corinth. Uh, see, Rome was a very much a transient group of people. It was the, the capital city of the world at the time, and people were going into the capital uh, for many reasons. And as Paul mentioned Phoebe, um, she was, some, for some reason, being transferred into the church in Rome. So today, if someone transfers from one church to another, typically a letter is sent, a letter transfer is sent to that new church, possibly even recommending that person that may be moving into their town. This is what is happening here. Uh, Phoebe is, some, for some reason, moving into Rome, or at least attending the Roman church for a time period, and Paul is recommending Phoebe to the church and saying, Phoebe is a servant. Phoebe is going to be a helper to your ministry because I have seen her do this in the early church. He is recommending her to the next church. And that word that he uses is servant. That word is a feminine form of the word that we actually translate deacon. And rather than this being a description of her position of, in the church, I actually see this more as a description of her activity. Because so if you know that word that uh, deacon is in the Greek, it is translated servant. And she served the church. Uh, she helped the sick. She was caring for the poor. She was discipling new believers. She was working behind the scenes uh, to love others. Very similar to the service responsibilities of a deacon. She was a servant. Listen, I, as we go through this, I don't have a list of names today uh, of those here with us as a list characteristics. Uh, but if you've been here for any extended period of time, you know there are women of NBC that serve here. I'm talking about those that behind the scenes are, are making meals for those that have had hard weeks or hospital stays or have suffered loss. I'm talking about those that are making phone calls and texts to come at the, just the right time to maybe a, a young mom that's struggling or to care for other women in the church. Uh, the prayers that are given on, on your behalf in the hallways of this church or over coffee. And of course, the dozens of ministries that are carried by the grace of God first and through the hard work of the women of NBC. These are, there are Phoebes in our church that are servants of Memorial Baptist Church, and you know that it's even greater, that are servants of their Lord God. And much of the time, we don't even hear about what they're doing. They're doing it behind the scenes and doing it for the name of the Lord. Now, there's a, there's a challenge here that I want to give the women of our church. There, I realize there are different levels of availability based on your stage in life or your work schedule or, or various other factors. But I will challenge you with this. You are called as a believer to serve others. It might look differently from one woman to another. And there's a world out there, though, that we see women tearing each other down, uh, playing the comparison game or gossiping about one another. But at Memorial, let this be a place where women are built up. They uh, admire and honor one another instead of comparing, and we are eliminating the gossip and replacing it with prayers and cards and caring texts. Because as Galatians 5.13 tells us, for you were called to freedom, in this case says brothers, but only applies to all of us, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Be servants. And secondly, we can see that Phoebe was also a helper. As some of your translations may say, a patron of many. And Paul even says, listen, she was even a helper to me. Uh, she helped so many. So many were touched by her life. And a patron was, according to Douglas Moo, he says this, quote, one who came to the aid of others 
especially foreigners, by providing housing and financial aid and by representing their interests before local authorities. Uh, so she was doing so much for so many people. Uh, some of the commentators even say that she was the one that was carrying this letter uh, to the Roman church in uh, behalf of Paul. So with her location by a seaport, uh, she was constantly seeing guests that were coming in from all over the known world. And what she was doing is she was inviting them over to her home. She was caring for them. Uh, she was showing great help. I want to share this. There's a um, row that is here in our church. It's one of my favorite rows. No offense to the other rows, but this is one of my favorite rows, and it actually extends a little further than it usually does. Um, this is how it started. It, it began with, and Sue, I don't mean to point you out, but um, who began attending here for decades ago, and then she was joined by Nancy, um, and then she, Nancy met someone at a store named Sherry, and Sherry's now in that road, and now uh, Judy visit on Easter, and now she's in that row, and now we have an additional friend in the row as well. This row continues to expand throughout our, our congregation here. That, that's what I'm talking about, being a, a help to others. Uh, seeing a guest walk in and, say, and inviting them in to your row and making them feel welcome, being a patron to others. And that's what Phoebe was doing. Literally, people were coming in in ships and coming to into her town, and she was welcoming them into her home, welcoming them into her row, so to speak. And women, I challenge you today to be examples of Phoebe's in our church, to be that patron to everyone that comes through our doors. And each of you have a responsibility to be a patron, a helper to others. It can look like this. It means at, at potlucks, when, when you see maybe a, a single mother trying to carry her plate and a number of other plates of her children, you go and help her. It means when you see guests come into our church lobby um, to the nursery as they juggle, juggle uh, bottles and snotty noses and a diaper bag, you go to their aid. That means whatever row you are sitting in, it becomes a welcome row for others. Believe it or not, we do not have assigned seating in here. <laughs> Please allow your row to be a welcome row to others. Be a servant to the Lord. Be a helper and a patron, just like Phoebe was. Well, we'll continue to read, and we'll see uh, a number of other ladies here. In verses 3 through 5, we see those that are risk takers and those that are hospitable. Verse 3. Greet Prissa and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I gave thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Apanetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Now, you might recognize the name of these two. Uh, one is, it must have been a nickname that Paul had for her. It was Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, they were friends of Paul. Uh, they were tent makers who welcomed Paul in Acts chapter 18 on Paul's second missionary journey. And when we went over Acts together, we talked about Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, they served alongside Paul. And it says in this passage that they risked their necks for Paul and the ministry of the gospel. I wish we had a little more detail of this. Most commentators say that it's referring to the riot that was in Acts chapter 19. And although they were always mentioned together in Scripture, being a married couple, uh, we, according to our time together, are going to focus on Priscilla's side of the story as we continue to honor women in ministry. First, she was a risk taker. Uh, Priscilla was there when Paul needed a friend in ministry, and apparently she was all in. Uh, but whatever she risked her life for, it must have been significant because in our passage it says that all the Gentile churches gave thanks for her and her husband. And she saw the necessity for the ministry of Paul, and what did she do? She put her life on the line for it. Now, I 
hope it never comes to this where you have to put your life on the line for the people of this church, for, for your pastors. But even though it, it might not be that severe, I'm going to ask you this question. What is it that you risk for the ministry of this church, the ministry for others, the ministry for your pastors, the ministry for the family of this church? What are you risking I'll give you a few examples here at Memorial. Your support of opening a Christian school shortly after a global pandemic, that is called a ministry risk. Voting in a lead pastor who was a youth pastor for all of his career to lead your church was a risk. And it still is. Opening a conversation with a coworker or a classmate about the gospel, that is a risk. Signing up to be an Awana teacher, knowing your margin may be tight, that is a risk. We talk about being a risk taker. It's not about jumping out of an airplane or climbing the side of a cliff. No, we're talking about being a risk taker of what God has called you to be. We'll give you a few examples from Scripture. It's the Esther, if I perish, I perish. It's the boys that were in the fire that said, but if not. It's the young shepherd with the stones and the sling. It's Paul saying, the will of the Lord be done. It's that type of attitude. The risk takers of the Priscilla's that will allow you to risk your life for Jesus Christ, for the gospel, and for our church. To be a risk taker. Kind of taking the uh, pendulum and swinging it quite the other way. We went from risk taker. Now we're going to be talking about hospitable. There are many here that open their homes uh, for small groups week in and week out. And I know that is not easy. It would be so much easier to just leave all of those dishes in the sink. It'd be so much easier to just leave everything out and not have to clean up before, you know you do this, before people come to your home. Or just to simply sit on your couch and watch a um, medical or crime show instead of inviting a whole small group into your home. But instead, you open up your home to others for Bible study, for prayer, and community. This was Priscilla's home. Uh, She was willing to host church inside of her home. And for her, hospitable was a risk taker, right? Because of what was going on around her. Uh, She was facing persecution, and she was willing to be hospitable to others. Might I encourage you to to open your home to those in this church, including also your neighborhood, your neighbors, co-workers, to friends, Yes, it is the introvert's nightmare. I understand that. (laughs) But it is honorable to do so. And introverts alike are invited, are encouraged, are commanded to do hospitality. 1 Peter 4, 9 tells us, not just the introverts, but everyone, show hospitality to one another. Do you know this word, this verse, without what? Grumbling. And if you're a, a closet, even a closet introvert like myself, and you may people coming to your house, you can't complain about that. That's something that you should want, should invite. And when it does happen, it is a blessing to your soul. Now, we're going to move to verse 6, and we're going to see hard workers hard workers. Verse 6. A short verse here, but an important one. It says, greet Mary who has worked hard for you. Uh, Following the mention of the first convert of Asia in verse 5, we find a very brief verse about a woman named Mary. Uh, She was likely a Jewish woman based on her name and who Paul's, Paul describes as someone who worked hard. She was a hard worker. And I don't know if this is just how it works, but uh, pretty much every Mary that I've met is a hard worker and is someone who is very kind, right? 
I don't know, that's just how it works out. But I, although this is a brief description, I, I find these words at the end very interesting, and it says these two words, for you. So what this tells us, and what we kind of insinuate based on those two words, that first of all, if Paul was addressing the church in Rome, that would suggest that Mary was likely a, a missionary based on this type of language. Um, it also suggests that she was part of the, had a leadership role in some way in the early church and helped with the gospel spread. And because she was mentioned so prominently and towards the beginning of this thankful letter and this thankful chapter, suggests that she had a very important role for the gospel and for the early church. Now, regardless of the correct detailed description, because those are just insinuations on my part and in the study of others, but we do know this, that she worked hard. We may not know what she did specifically, but we know that she worked hard for the Roman church. She was a hard worker. And wouldn't that be a wonderful description of your life? That people would describe you as someone that worked hard for your church, that worked hard for the gospel, that worked hard for others. So what is your relationship with the church? How would it be described? Do you work hard for the church? Uh, that word that is used here is the same word that describes the disciples that, that toiled all night in the boat and did not catch anything. They, were just, they just worked really, really hard and they worked all throughout the night. Does that describe your labor on behalf of the church? See, Mary was a laborer for the ministry of the church just like so many women of our church as we honor them today. And as Colossians 3, verse 23 says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Hard workers. Next we see in verse 7, those that are fearless and faithful. Verse 7, greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles and they were in Christ before me. Now, okay, I, I, I'm being honest here. I had to read up on this one because uh, this uh, woman, I believe it is a woman, uh, is more attested as some uh, believe that it was Junius, not Junia. Uh, some believe this was referring to a man and not referring to a woman. This is why I believe, uh, again, this is According to my study, um, and based on what I saw in the study and, and was able to deduce, I'm going to give you a few reasons why I think it, Junia, is a woman. Here's a few. Uh, first of all, it was written in a pair, uh, hinting that this was likely a married couple. Uh, we look at the form that the name is in, feminine. We also look at uh, ancient commentaries that call Junia a woman. It also points towards uh, Junia being another woman uh, to honor here, based on those few things. But wanted to note the discrepancy that you may st see in your own study. Junia was a believer uh, who was a dedicated ministry partner. Uh, in fact, Junia, as it says here, was a fellow prisoner of Paul. Uh, talk about going the limit for the gospel, willing to be jailed for her faith. Now, that must have been quite the bond that she had with Paul, where they were in a ministry meeting, and Paul says, listen, we're going to do this, and you might go to jail. And her and Adronicus, which is a superior name, it did not make the list for our kids, and I'm a little disappointed, but Adronicus and Junia were willing, they, in that ministry meeting, they just said yeah, cool, we might go to jail. And guess what? They did for the purpose of the gospel. They were fearless. Fearless. Junia was fearless. Next thing we see is they were faithful. Junia was faithful. Even before Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, 
These two were faithful missionaries of the gospel. So even before they met Paul, they were part of being missionaries with the gospel. And this is, um, which is how many interpret that word apostle uh, is a missionary of the gospel. And that's how I will interpret it today. Uh, so faithful, in fact, they, excuse me, <laughs> so faithful, in fact, they were well known. Um, some translations have it that they were outstanding. Uh, they were highly respected for their faithful work uh, for the gospel in the early church. And as was mentioned before, they were willing to take risks for the gospel, so much so that they were willing to have shackles on their feet and on their hands. They fearlessly shared the gospel. Uh, now, Paul called them kinsmen. Uh, it was possibly because of their ethnic relationship. I don't see this as being blood-related. I get the sense that this was referring to their kindred spirit, seeing that they were staying in the prisons together, relentless for the gospel together, faithful in their witness together, and fearless in their face of the opposition together. Uh, Junia was a woman who was relentless, faithful, and fearless. And let me tell you, those are the characteristics of the pillars of the women of our church. But I will say this as well. As we talk about Mother's Day together, someone who is relentless, someone who is faithful, someone who is fearless, that describes a godly mother. And we honor you today. Next we see in verses 8 through 12, and you can pray for me as I read these names. <laughs> uh, we see workers... In the Lord, verses 8 through 12. Greet Ampliatitis, or Ampliatus, there we go, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachus. Greet Apellus, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the Lord of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. That would be tough to have that name, I'm just being honest. You're a family of narcissists. Anyways, verse 12. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Perses, who has worked hard in the Lord. So sorry to the gentlemen of uh, verses 8 through 11. We are going to skip over you today. It's Mother's Day, and we are going to focus on the three ladies of this passage. Tryphena, Tryphosa, and the, believe it, the beloved Perses. We're going to start with the workers in the Lord, which, are, which is how Tryphena and Tryphosa were described. You might notice that these are two very similar names. And what we can deduce from this is they were likely sisters. Because in that culture, uh, you would often name uh, your children very similar names. And these were so similar that many commentators suggest that they were actually twins. And uh, so they would be named very similar um, because of that. Uh, George Foreman, the former heavyweight champion boxer of the world, would fit very well during this time period as he named all five of his sons George. And one of his seven daughters, he named Georgetta. So he's very fond of that name. Very similar names throughout his children. But anyways, the early church was marked by the women workers for the Lord. Uh, they, were ministry, they had ministries uh, that were for the church and for the gospel. And these two sisters, who some say were slaves at one time, uh, were given their freedom. And with that freedom, they were devoted in their service to the Lord, so much so that they were risking their freedom once again for the gospel. Secondly, we see Perseus. It's translated a, a Persian woman. So this may not even have been her name, and this may have been a description. Uh, she, though, was a likely a, a single woman of the church. Um, during the study, it says that uh, many have said that she was a former slave that was also uh, freed and now is uh, being commended for her hard work for the Lord. She is beloved. Now listen, I have stood on my soapbox uh, and the importance of those that are single in our congregation, uh, in our church family. And I'm going to do so again, but before I do, uh, I want to challenge those that are single and here with us 
Uh, these characteristics very much apply to you, even to the point of our next characteristic as well, and you'll see that in a few moments. Um, I want to say a few things. Singleness does not preclude you from being hospitable. Uh, you may have to prepare before, beforehand with, with toys for, for families that come over. You might have to prepare the ma- meal in advance so you can both host and prepare um, at the same, or so you don't have to host and prepare at the same time. Um, you are not exempt. God has given a biblical imperative to all of us to serve and be hospitable. And I know many of our singles do so. But let me say this too. Uh, those that are married, those that have kids, you need to be hospitable to our singles. Uh, Shannon and I like to give advance warning when a single comes to our house um, and offer earplugs and suggest body armor. <laughs> but we love to include uh, singles into our home, and I, I hope that, that you love that as well, that you would love to have singles over, to invite them over to dinner after a church service and make them part of your life. Listen, I want to say this as well. There should never be a lonely person in our church. Can I say that again? There should never be a lonely person in our church. The singles, those who attend without a spouse, the teenager who comes on their own, or the faithful widow... Memorial Baptist Church family, I hope that your heart is that no one feels alone. And back to, as we spoke of this single woman, I want to say this too, that we have to be careful what we say to our singles. And our singles could probably attest to this. There have been some cringe-worthy moments of what has been said to you. So might I encourage us to be mindful of our... Of, of their hearts and how to speak to them. Uh, for women like Percy, a single woman who, who worked very hard for the Lord, she was honored. And as it says in, in 1 Corinthians 7, it tells us that singleness can provide the ability to devote themselves to be how these women are described here, workers in the Lord. And that's what Perseus was. She was a woman who was disciplined and had a godly single life, and Paul was commending her for it. And the same can be said for the many singles of our church, specifically our women. You you face challenges, you face difficulties, and you have remained faithful and have worked hard for the Lord. And you, just like Perseus, are beloved by our church. And in the end, it's all about allowing your life, whether it's single, married, divorced, widowed, Will your life be one that is described as a worker for the Lord? One who works hard for the Lord. Next we move to verse 13. And it is those that are described as motherly. Verse 13 says, Greet Rufus, another great name, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me, as well. So here we are on Mother's Day in the book of Romans, and we are recognizing and honoring a mother. I mean, how I I just think that's cool. In this case, it was Rufus's mother who was honored by Paul, uh, saying these words, precious words. Underline, if you're someone that underlines in your Bible, this is precious. Who has been a mother to me as well. Now, no confirmation of this, but many commentators state that it is quite possible that Rufus's father was Simeon. Uh, In Mark chapter 15, it actually lists that relation. If you want to write down Mark 15, 21, you can look at it later. It was the man who helped Jesus carry his cross to Golgotha. And what a connection this would be that this woman that is so affectionately described by Paul is the cross-bearer's wife. A strong man with a gentle wife. There are women in our church who have no blood relation to uh, those that are younger than them but still have the ability to be motherly to them. 
I see this over and over and over again. It might be those that you have taught in your children's class at the, when they're in third grade and now they're in 13th grade. <laughs> maybe those that you have helped as a youth leader and you see them grow up or maybe as a teen you are motherly over them or maybe just someone younger, maybe not even by age, but just maybe younger in the faith, you are motherly to them. It's what's described to illustrate comfort and care in Isaiah chapter 49 and chapter 66. It's the relationship that we see described in Titus chapter 2. It's a motherly relationship. It's the relationship that Paul was able to have with Rufus's mom. It's a special relationship where wisdom can be shared and care given. I'll I'll try my best to get through this next part as it's extremely personal to me. Uh, Mother's Day uh, can be bittersweet for many. Um, As we treasure the memory of our moms that have gone before us, and I am one of those as I was a teenager when my mother passed away. But like Rufus's mom to Paul, uh, there were women in the church that I grew up in Uh, that looked after me. Um, They were like mothers to me, whether I liked it or not. (laughs) Uh, They would have have me over for meals. Uh, They sent me cookies while I was away at college, and they checked up on me. Uh, There was one mom in the church that went over and above. Uh, She was always having me over for loaded nachos, allowed me to be part of her family, invited me to play games with her kids. And thinking back to that time, I don't know how, and I probably did, overstay my welcome because I was over there all the time. Uh, But she provided a home away from home uh, when I was really hurting. Um, She and her husband even met me at the mall to help me pick out a suit for graduation. Uh, She would give me advice on girls, and one of the pieces of advice she gave me was, don't be kissing before you have that ring. (laughs) Well, God knew that I needed a mom during that time, and uh, today, today I call her mom. Because God also knew that one day I would fall in love with her daughter. And I can't even see my notes. Okay. <laughs> and now I get to call her mom officially. Um, women of NBC, I, I know you're busy. I know that. You do so much. And your plate is so very full. But that mom in that story had five kids of her own and a million things to do. But she constantly showed up in my life. And my life is forever changed because of her. So I, uh, I encourage you to be motherly to invite one of those teen girls over for loaded nachos, uh, to send a card to a girl in, in your Awana class, to find time to give advice and encouragement to a young man. Uh, be motherly like Rufus's mother. Um, Paul needed a home where he, when he traveled, and, and maybe some loaded nachos, I don't know. But Rufus's mother provided a home for him. And if Paul needed it, if the Apostle Paul needed it in his missionary journeys, there are kids and young people and young believers in our church that need it as well. We need the women of our church to be motherly. Treat them like family. Because one day, they just might be. (laughs) And finally, 
and verses 14 through 16. We see those that are blameless and dedicated. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobas, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Narius, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. So two more women as we close out our honoring of women in ministry. Uh, Julia and Nereus' sister. Uh, Julia was likely uh, Philologus' wife um, and likely Roman citizens. And it is possible, now just possible, uh, that Nereus and his sister were their children. Uh, like some of the other names, that's just clearly speculation based on how the passage reads. Now, the reason we derive the characteristics written on your screen of, of blameless and dedicated is that these two are lumped into the category of saints, and that's what saints mean. Uh, some of the, the uh, definition, inside the definition of saint is blameless and dedicated. And it seems that their house was those of saints, and possibly even a house church. And while their ministries and accomplishments for the Lord are not listed here, and they may not, probably didn't even want them to be listed, they were simply dedicated saints of the Lord, willing to serve the Lord and the gospel mission that Paul was set on as a missionary. And we have that in our church. We have those that are just dear saints, and we describe them that way. Those that are blameless, that are dedicated, that assist others in their ministry, that help others, that serve the Lord in a special way. So as we started today, we came up with, with some goals. Uh, first, uh, for the women in our church to be honored uh, for what they do for our church, that they are honored, that they are thanked, and that they are recognized for their work in the Lord. So I want to do that right now. I want to thank all the women of our church and all that they do for Memorial Baptist Church. Can we thank them today? Our women have so much talent and abilities and gifts and intelligence, and we, may we always be a church that highlights, has an opportunity for, and connects our women to allow them to use their characteristics to flourish here. Second, Paul was able to present godly characteristics of, of women throughout this list. And if we take a look at this list and write down possibly what characteristics that you want or you need or you need to work on in your life, and this is for everyone. We can all use, except for maybe for the motherly, for the guys, but all of us could look at these characteristics and find ways that we can maybe improve or for God to work on our hearts. I'll list them for you. We have servant, helper, risk taker, hospitable, hard worker, fearless, faithful, worker in the Lord, motherly, blameless, and dedicated. Listen, we, we are not asking for the world here. These are attainable. These are attainable goals and characteristics that you can have in your life. And I want to encourage you to find ways to, to overcome excuses, to pray for strength in these character qualities, and to commit to be disciplined in the growth in these areas. And to our moms here, you have a difficult job. You rarely get a break. You're often overtired and overwhelmed we honor you today. And so what I'd like to do is, is clo close in a word of prayer as we pray for our moms and also as we pray for the women of our church. So if we could bow in a word of prayer together. Dear Lord, we, as we spoke on today, as we shared today, we are so thankful for the women of our church how they serve, how they care. Now may Memorial Baptist Church not fall short in allowing them to flourish 
in the ways that you desire of them for the body of Christ, for the gospel, for the glory of your name, for the benefit of the church, the body of Christ. And Father, I want to lift up the moms, um, the daily challenges that they face, the fatigue, the worries, the stresses. Lord, that you would provide them the strength for today and the hope for tomorrow. Lord, I pray that you would uplift them, that you would encourage them today. Lord, I pray for, as we remember moms, those that may have suffered loss, that you would be with them today, that you would wrap your arms around them, that you would provide them comfort. Lord, again, I pray for the mothers here, mothers listening, Father, that you would give them the strength each day, that they'd be willing to work on the characteristics that were shared today and strive after those in their lives, and they would give them the strength to do so. I thank you, Lord, for passages like this, hidden at, not really hidden, but put at the end of Romans, that we can study together, that we can be taught, but we can also honor those around us. We love you so very much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us. I hope you felt welcome and challenged by God's word and were blessed by our time in worship. At Memorial Baptist Church, we strive to invite people to know and follow Christ. And our YouTube channel is one of the ways we do just that. So please feel free to subscribe down below and share it with others. If you'd like to learn more about NBC, visit our website at nbconline.org. And if you'd like to give to our ministries here at Memorial, there's a link below to do just that as well. We hope to see you again soon. 